hospital was 30 minutes from home. Of course I didn't pack a bag because I wasn't expected to be admitted at 29 weeks pregnant. I also wasn't prepared to deliver my baby preterm at 31 weeks either. But preeclampsia left us with little choice. I was born and raised in New Jersey, but I never liked living here. I met my boyfriend of two years and running wild in high school. While I never wanted kids, he wanted a huge family. So after a few discussions, we decided we'd eventually have a child together. We were a year and eight months into our relationship when, surprise, I found out I was pregnant. We never intended for this to happen so soon. I mean, I was 18 and he was 19. But sometimes you use all the right tools and a swimmer still gets through. But you should have seen us. We were both beyond excited. Nine months before we became a wonderful, proper family. No time at all. Three months down the line, we packed up and left New Jersey because we didn't want to raise our baby there. Instead, we moved to North Carolina, staying with his mother and starting our new adventure, the next step in our bright lives. Month six came, and that's when things began to creep downhill. I've always had problems with headaches, but this time, they seemed worse than usual. That should have been, and it was, my one chance to get ahead of the disaster that was on the horizon. But when I brought it up with my nurse at my six-month checkup, they told me not to worry about it. Because of my pregnancy, I couldn't take ibuprofen to keep the migraines at bay, so I began to have them every night. Even though I felt a bit suspicious, I soon grew sort of used to them, and eventually just lived with them as best as I could. If medical professionals said it wasn't an issue, then that was that. After a while, my feet started to swell up, ballooning pretty badly. This was something I told myself to ignore, since it also happened to my aunt when she was pregnant, and everything turned out fine for her. They say ignorance is bliss, right? Up next was our baby shower in New Jersey, and spending time with all of our families and relatives was spectacular. The cozy, exciting atmosphere, the presence, having fun with everyone, it was almost enough to balance out the unbearable headaches and sore, swollen feet that were getting worse every day. Almost. I had a checkup the day after we went back to North Carolina. Bone tired and heavily pregnant, I shambled out of the house in my pajamas with a throbbing headache and warped feet in slides. Two bits of clothing that were the only things that fit me comfortably anymore. I thought I'd be back home in a hot second, that it was just going to be a routine checkup. So, of course, that's when it all hit the fan. It started way too normally. Walk in, check in, sit down, wait. Elena Pierce, please come get your vitals done. Temperature check, wait, nothing to sneeze at by now. Blood pressure, and the uncertainty begins. The nurse tells me not to worry. Okay, fine. We check it again. Let me get the doctor. Five words that weighed my heart down like stones. Worry really starts to set in when she comes back without the doctor and moves me to a different room. She asks if I'm here with anyone, calm as ever. I tell her that my boyfriend's waiting in the parking garage. I think it's best you bring him in. I don't think I've ever felt so afraid so fast. My boyfriend arrived with the doctor who told me that I need to be admitted for preeclampsia. They'd have to check my urine sample for traces of protein to confirm things, but by now I was already texting my parents. Preeclampsia. That word. Big and awkward to say, pinballed through my brain. Mom said, Oh no! While my dad floored me with, You and your daughter can both die from that, you know. Not a single word minced. While waiting for the test results, I tried to research this new, unexpected enemy, preeclampsia. Scrolling anxiously on my phone, the screen blurred by my tear-soaked eyes. Beyond that, preeclampsia was basically a blood monster. It terrorized the placenta, suffocating the blood vessels that kept the flow between mother and baby, cutting off the supply. The blood vessels would send an SOS signal to the body, causing increased blood pressure from the mother's side which was a nasty goblin orchestrating my headaches. Organ failure could occur too, no matter how severe the symptoms were. I read that kidneys were the main ones at risk, 
because high blood pressure really stops them from working properly. Was this what I had to look forward to? The moment I looked up and saw the doctor's face, I knew that, yes, yes it was. Each time the doctor spoke, it was like a chunk was being carved out of my life. You'll be on magnesium sulfate to ease the symptoms, preventing high blood pressure, seizures, and strokes. You'll feel dizzy and exhausted, kind of like anesthetics, but you won't be put to sleep. And because of the medication, we'll be inserting a catheter because you won't be able to walk. And because of the medication, you won't be able to eat or drink anything, but you can chew on ice chips instead. What a great compromise. I was reduced to a motionless, lifeless mannequin, barely remembering anything that was happening, chained down by medication that was supposed to save my life. The most important thing was to bring down my blood pressure. So when that was under control, they took me off that hellish medication after however many days. Oh, I was beyond ecstatic, vowing never to take things for granted ever again. Things like taking a shower, like eating as much as I wanted, like walking. Never mind that they told me to take it easy for now. Even though they monitored my every move, trying to make sure my baby and I were in the safe zone, I still tried to live every day to the fullest. It didn't last long though. I got more medication to try to maintain low blood pressure. But despite taking as much medication as I could over the next few days, I still began to feel pain in my upper abdomen. Organ failure, maybe? I was put on steroids to boost my daughter's lung growth, to fast forward her development as much as possible in case of a premature birth. As a result, my blood pressure spiked again, so there was talk of inducing labor the next day. Labor? Already? I thought to myself, with a thudding heart that had nothing to do with my blood pressure. I'm only at 31 weeks! My baby's lungs aren't even fully grown! But things moved forward anyway, like they always did. And so it began. The longest 29 hours of my life. They gave me Pitocin, as well as that horrible magnesium again, to make sure the forced labor wouldn't trigger a seizure or a stroke. The contractions started, and the scary thing was, I didn't feel them at all. My memory was hazy, I was hardly conscious. Like my body was physically there, but I was just fading, floating. One thing's for sure though, I know my boyfriend was by my side for all of it. He fetched me anything and everything I needed. Gave me water, wiped my face, fed me crackers. My anchor in the storm. To add to the list of things I was being put on, they suggested an epidural for the pressure as well as to help with pushing, since all that bed rest earlier earned me a bacterial infection. At last, it was my time to shine. I pushed for 15 minutes, I think. Everything was so blurry, but there it was. My 15 minutes of fame and my beautiful, wonderful daughter, two months early, three pounds and six ounces. Tiny as anything, but with strong, healthy lungs and no complications whatsoever. Unlike her mother, she didn't cry at all. Just made these cute, cooing baby noises that were like music to my ears. They allowed me to see her the next day. In fact, the nurses insisted Go see your daughter. Go take a walk. You need to be on your feet. Some even got angry with me, as if I was willingly keeping myself away from a newborn daughter. No one knew what I'd just been through. And the worst part is that it wasn't all over yet. I might have escaped the preeclampsia, but I couldn't run away from the depression that hit me like a truck afterwards. I've always grappled with depression and anxiety issues. So postpartum depression or not, that last horrible month of pregnancy leading up to a birth I can barely remember were such traumatizing experiences that honestly, I shouldn't have been surprised. It was a train of never-ending troubles and I wanted off. I was stuck in the hospital for another two weeks because my blood pressure stayed high, if you could believe it. It felt like two years. I'd been there for so long, too long. Cabin fever on top of medication and depression was a recipe for wreckage. After sleeping in a pool of my own tears every night, I had to beg the nurses, the doctors, to just let me go home. 
It became all I could think about, overwhelming every waking moment. I wanted to go home. I wanted to go home. When they finally let me go, it was midnight. But I didn't even notice. Didn't even care. I fled from the hospital like there were hounds at my heels. But as I ran away, I felt my heart was tearing in two. Because my daughter had to stay there for two more months. Finally, finally, the wait was over. We brought her home safe and healthy in my arms. And that moment alone made everything so, so worth it. I still had to be checked once a month for my blood pressure and was eventually given medication and stern word to keep checking in with my local doctor to make sure that there was no risk of seizures. My blood pressure calmed down after three months, but each day felt like a breeze now that my daughter was home.